Once in the Mirror, Chapter 18, Town Life. In 1837, the railway line was laid that linked London to Birmingham, passing through Wembley and Harrow. In 1873, Parliament accepted a plan for, for the London, Harrow and Pinner Railway, which would terminate between the Grove and Cannon Lane Farmhouse, now the Whittington Hotel. Five years later, the terminus was moved to Pinner Green. In 1880, Harrow Metropolitan Station was opened, and just four years later, Marsh Farm was demolished, making room for the new station. On the 25th of May, 1885, two days before Pinner Fair, the line was up and running. Steam trains ran every half an hour to Baker Street. The chairman of the Great Central Railway, which had joint running rights over the Metropolitan Line, decided on North Harrow as the correct place to build a new station. The fields between London and Pinner had been extensively developed, with 300 roads created. The existing railway station could no longer cope with the influx of passengers. The station opened on the 22nd of March, 1915, just where a farm access road passed under the existing line. The Metropolitan Railway line affected the character of North West Middlesex and with it North Harrow. The peak year for new builds was 1934 and the houses were built for white collar workers and highly paid manual workers. Average their weekly wage was then £2.15 shillings. North Harrow Station opened in 1915. It nestled in a hollow under the railway bridge, spanning Station Road, which was recognised by the telephone boxes at the entrance of the booking hall. The architectural style looked to the age of Art Deco rather than Art Nouveau, observed in the letter form, tile and paintwork colour schemes. It declared the age of the Metropolitan Railway Line, a line that ran between Baker Street and Amersham, Aldersgate and Aylesbury. The train company's brown livery decorated the carriages. All the Aylesbury line locomotives were steam-driven, as were a number of the Metropolitan. The majority, however, were powered by electric motors, and it wasn't until some years after the war that the line was completely electrified. The carriages held ten people sitting five on either side. In the rush hour, a further six stood swaying while adjusting their stance, attempting, attempting to keep their feet. Clasped hold of the leg, luggage rack, each tried to read. Smokers, who were the majority, relied on the nearest person to open the window to suffer the draughts, occasional drops of rain and smoke. The interior sprung seats bounced the occupants to the tune of the joints in the rail as the train swayed and lurched along the track. The seated, appreciating their luck, began to nod off. It was only the first and last compartments that banned smoking. All the others smelt strongly of tobacco. On cold and wet days, the carriage windows soon steamed, steamed up with condensation. Areas cleared of mist made by the person sitting next to the window gave a clue as to the whereabouts of the train on the line. The dripping raincoats, flapping umbrellas and sneezing passengers heaved a concerted sigh as the train moved off. Conversation again stilled as newspapers were opened. At eye level, underneath the netted luggage racks, brass-framed prints advertised seaside resorts. A London underground map took up the centre frame, frequently hidden when the carriage was crowded, causing panic for passengers unfamiliar with the line, not knowing where they were. Platforms and waiting rooms were made jointly of wood, emblazoned with hearts and arrows, carved by the younger passengers, proclaiming their heart's desire. More pungent cartoonists criticised the punctuality of trains which they often died waiting for. At night you could see the orange glow of the open fireboxes as the firemen shoveled in another load of coal. 
the shunting tank engines coupling up their wagons in the sidings gave cheery toots as their flashy com- cousins the express trains thundered on their way warnings more urgent a shriek that gradually fell away as they disappeared up the line the nightly routine of cold delivery into the pens continued su- supervised by the controller as the night-long process resumed as with all large towns several bus routes serviced the citizens some ran to ha- ran to harrow and northward others to rainus lane and wheelstone they were mostly single deckers and all had their conductors who issued punch tickets they ran at ten minute intervals servicing a growing queue as the time approached rush hour a bus ride was a community affair getting on and off lurching from hand bar to strap up the bus the favoured seat the ringing the bell standing in pack togetherness listening to each other's conversations and wiping the condensation off the windows it wasn't often that someone was turned away even if the bus was overcrowded the conductor stood at the door taking the fares of all the unpaid passengers those he wasn't able to get to when he forced his way up the aisle piling up the spent tickets underfoot he was an expert at dishing out loose change having a pile of pennies in his hand ready as he punched the green cards horses and liveried car- carts made local deliveries elsie took up a, t- a, pa- a delivery of milk in quart pint and half pint bottles and quite often the milkman would leave a crate for collection the next time he called the rag and bone man came round in his cart calling out any old iron or rags and bones in a sing-song voice and the knife sharpener echoed with scissors to grind the newspaper seller on the corner of pinner road and station road stood by his upturned orange box outside united dairies his newspapers folded under his arm calling out through rolled cigarette star news or standard the insurance man came to collect the life premium the household cleaning salesman called to sell dusters brushes and dustpans and the encyclopedia britannica and book club salesman visited four times a year postman delivered a mail twice a day and the telegraph boy was often to be seen on his bike both were dressed in the uniform of the post office the postman wore a suit and peaked cap collar and tie the telegraph boy wore a dark blue uniform with red piping and a pillbox cap carrying the telegrams in a leather shoulder bag they rode both rode a red bike on loan from the sorting office all the premier shops and stores delivery men and tradesmen wore a uniform that declared their status status and business another social habit and conforming ritual ritual and define the age so differently from today's casualness and informality coal and coke was delivered in hundredweight sacks delivered by the coal man wearing his leather hooded and shouldered apron at least four times a year a gypsy woman called to sell pegs and a posy of heather children played in the streets and called at each other's houses roller skates held roller skaters held onto the backs of passing carts the chalked stumps still visible on the garage doors from the match the day before stayed all through the war mothers left their babies in coach-built prams outside their front doors to take in the morning air as cumberland road continued its daily life uninterrupted and contemptuous of all distant international events english society wasn't altering its habits one jot to suit any jumped up foreigners declared the papers the jolliest annual attraction attended by the majority of children was pillar fair the license granted by king edward the third in thirteen thirty six their parents needing little encouragement attended in the evenings the fair took up the whole of high street and pinner road being with the arm's length of the houses on either side of the road 
stalls and merry-go-rounds, helter-skelter, ghost house and a candy floss, roll a penny and toss a ring, all vied for attention. The stall owners shouting out in encouragement. The streamers, strung lights and colourful bunting all contributed to the colourful occasion, whilst the steam organs piped out the old pre-war tunes. The fair, held one day a week, a week, uh, only a year, the first Wednesday after wit, its charter awarded by Edward I, was always well attended, even during the war years. There were never any disturbances, needing the authority of a policeman, although they, although they were very evident. The nearest workhouse one time stood behind the George Public House in Pinner, Union workhouses and guardians of the poor were abolished in 1929, their place being taken up by the Public Assistance Committee under the MCC, the workhouse being an institution and the infirmary a hospital. Pinner became a parish which separated it from Harrow. In 1766, Greater Harrow was formed in 1934, uniting Wealdstone, Hendon and Harrow under the title of Harrow Urban District Council. Harrow Borough received its Charter of Incorporation in 1954. In population and rateable value, Harrow became the largest urban district in England and Wales, secured its civic status and granted a charter. A charter. North Harrow Pinner, Wealdstone and Rainers Lane were all part of this mighty borough along with other one-time hamlets. They all were within comfortable walking distance and each had a cinema. This, this was the middle of the prosperous period, one of, the ex of expansion and full employment. This happy state of affairs could be seen in the demeanour of its citizens and in the ordered environment. All of this was about to change. North Harrow, that autumn, was a town with pride. As there was no industry in North Harrow, it was un e unusual to see any heavy traffic. The one exception was the brewer's dray drawn by four huge shire horses with jingling harness and tiny brass bells on their heads driven by the drayman with his bowler hat sitting on a high seat at the front of the dray. The heavy open-sided wagon clattered along the road making for the Headstone Hotel. Its iron-clad wheels appeared to us uh, uh, children as massive. The drayman had a waterproof sheet drawn over his knees in all weathers. At his side, a long whip stood in its holder. The carrier's van would be seen most days. The only large motor wagon belonged to the local removers called Willis. Its green painted sides proclaimed its purpose, guaranteeing same-day service. As the prosperity of the townspeople improved, some of the fathers acquired motorbikes, while others added a sidecar. The wife sat on the pillion seat and the children sat in the sidecar. It was a popular way for families to meet up, having a day out at the seaside. As there were few cars, the motorcycles assumed an important part of family life. The AA patrolman was available for their owner's assistance, as if they became members. The brown uniformed patrolman had a regular route to patrol, and their motorbike and sidecar was painted a bright yellow, and often to be seen. The sidecar carried all his equipment necessary for basic repairs, his brown uniformed jacket, jobfers, high calf leather boots and leather gauntlets were accompanied by polished brass buttons, peat hat and AA badge. If he passed a car or motorbike bearing an association badge, he saluted whether he was attending to a repair or not. His route took him past the yellow boxes decorated with little gardens which carried a telephone with either he could use to any member of the association. The nearest box was in Station Road close to the British restaurant.
Unemployment in 1935 to 50 and for the following 20 years was not an issue. The main concern to Albert and El Elsie was the advancement of war brought on by the German attitude. A build-up of incidents which led to Chamberlain on the uh, 11.15 radio announcement on, a Saturday, on Sunday the 3rd of September 1939 which took the country into war. The solemn statement was made with bated breath, Chamberlain's voice, a rather high, brittle voice with clipped intonation, was rather theatrical, as though expecting a cheer. France announced that they would be at war with Germany that afternoon, as did Australia and New Zealand. South Africa announced their intentions three days later and Canada followed within the week. Whilst all this was going on, the inhabitants of North Harrow continued their lives as if nothing was happening. On the continent, British troops advanced through France to Lille, near the Belgium frontier. They dug defences, then advanced, leaving their prepared positions, then fell back, never to fully recover. The army was unfit for war, inadequately equipped, carrying outdated weapons and adopting inept tactics in a doomed campaign. By the end of the following May, the British Army was in full retreat to the coast and Dunkirk to re-embark and be shipped back home. It was thought by the populace that it was an act of providence, like the River Jordan parting. In fact, it demonstrated an, an almost total ineptitude brought on by thoughtlessness and ignorance, exhibited by most of the political and military elite. It took almost four years to recover. Then the outcome was inevitable. However, by that time, Britain was in debt to America and never to regain its premier position in the world. The British restaurant chain was a government institution organised in 1942 to cater for people who could not, for one reason or another, cook their own meals. There was one in Bennett's Park Station Road, North Harrow, and behind the cinema at Rainers Lane. For a shilling you could buy a three-course meal when they first opened. They were che cheaply built as prefect prefabrications on a concrete slab and seen in most large towns. Others situated in suitable halls or galleries. In effect, they were, they were soup kitchens, but on a far larger scale, and served a variety of meals. After the war, they still existed, but soon operated on a different footing, having to make a profit. They were hired out, hired out for jumbo sales and evening classes, in effect becoming community centres. And by 1943 they served 700,000 meals per day, charging an increased fee of one shilling and tuppence for a two-course meal. Sharing the same site at the back of the British restaurant was the home guard hut. The manager David Village's fa father, Basil, served there throughout the war and afterwards too. It served also as number 21 air raid precaution and warden's post. The war had very little effect on our young lives. It was almost seen as normal. We were in, at war with the Germans again. The cinema showed us how the war was progressing. The newsreel cameras of Pathé exposed the ever-efficient militaristic Germans and the casual, nonchalant British, always never quite getting it right. Thankfully, the Germans made more mistakes than we did. The area police station was at Pinner, two miles down the Pinner Road. You would always see a police officer on duty walking along the main road of all towns, at least twice a day and again during the night, checking all the shop doors and windows, the alleyways and side roads. The patrolling sergeant who would phone into the police station using the blue call boxes found at most main roads junctions. If, as a child or even adult, told to abide by the law, you did as instructed. 
police officers were very much respected citizens, perhaps even feared, and they saw to it that there was no cycling on the pavement and bikes had efficient brakes and a bell. All parks, recreation grounds and sports areas were monitored by their keepers, who acted very much like police officers in their duties. The Yedding Walk Gardens or Streamside Walk and Pinner Park, as all the other parks in the borough, had carefully designed flower beds arranged in floral decoration to give a fantastic riot of colour all summer season. Their beauty replicated those gardens at the seaside and London parks. The grass beautifully manicured and the edges trimmed. There was no cycling or roller skating, no walking on the grass or running about. The gardens facilities were built for recreational walking and in good maintenance, considered important to the town's standing. Bands played every weekend at the larger parks. Fountains worked paving was regularly levelled and autumn leaves gathered. Cricket pitches, bowling greens and tennis courts all carefully manicured and maintained. Competition organised by the local authorities between each other awarded certificates to the best head gardener who vied to outdo each other. The workers used their winning certificates to obtain better jobs. Councils produced their own seedlings trees and plants at the town's nursery. The local park was Streamside Walk. Its paths wandered over stone bridges alongside the river. Within easy walking distance of home were Pinner Park, West Harrow Park and Headstone Recreational Ground, all giving the, the local children ample play areas. Streets had their own sweepers, who swept into the gutters the dust and waste made up into piles, to be loaded onto their carts and taken back to the council depot. Dustmen called once a week in the corporation dust cart, which had curved sliding lids to, uh, to a half a dozen compartments. Each house had their own dustbin. Sandboxes were at main street corners, cut tops and bottoms of hills and level crossings to allow sand to be spread to give grip to horses and cars in icy conditions. <laughs>